how do we talk about heart failure? Well, first of all, we need to define heart failure, right? And that seems simple until you step into the world of adult congenital. So how do you truly decide when an adult congenital patient has heart failure? So there really is no true consensus definition of heart failure in an adult congenital population. And then we have to go back because unlike patients with acquired heart failure, adult congenital heart disease patients have never had a normal myocardium. Their heart has been abnormal since birth. Um, and there's really been no single inciting event like a big myocardial infarction, like the development of severe valvular disease that start into context these, this wave of neurohormonal changes, adverse remodeling, subsequent clinical deterioration. And so when in their, in their progress or, or when in their lifetime do you say you have heart failure? So what is helpful in predicting heart failure? So obviously more increased lesions. So the more complex their congenital heart disease, they're more likely they are to have heart failure. That makes sense. If they report a worsening NYHA class, so again, not the class that they report at baseline, but if they re report a worsening class, and BMP levels I think may be helpful. I think one of the things that's also important is what hasn't been shown to be reliable in predicting heart funds is actually their systemic ventricular function. So even if we see it and it's bad, we should pay attention to it, but that doesn't necessarily always correlate that they're going to develop heart failure. And, and of course, by data that we've shown in our own acquired HEFPEF patients, just because you have a normal EF doesn't mean you're not going to develop heart failure. The peak MVO2, although helpful, may be in following patients and letting them be their own baseline, but a single MVO2 point is not, hasn't been shown to be that predictable. And also some other things like hyponatremia and other options have not been shown to be uh, predictable, uh, reliable predictors for predicting heart failure. When we look at that as a port to mortality, this data I think really drove that home. If you look at our, these are in just adult congenital heart disease patients. If you didn't have heart failure, yeah, your mortality and survival is pretty good. But look if you do have heart failure. So over a five-fold increase in mortality uh, once patients develop heart failure. And so again, heart failure is, and this was, um, they looked at it in, with a single hospital admission, there was a 25% risk of death within the first year following that admission. So again, just like in our acquired um, heart disease, heart disease in the congenital world is also a very um, morbid event that can have high mortality. So let's jump over into uh, when we have a subpulmonic ventricle, um, that's the RV, and we start having dysfunction in that ventricle. And so what's the classic of that? That's going to be your tetralogy of Fallot patient, okay? So is your te repair tetralogy of Fallot. Uh, remember, many of these patients, especially back up until this last decade, when they repaired their tetralogy of Fallot, they actually basically just cut away their pulmonary valve. And so many of these patients were left with wide open pulmonary regurgitation, and the thought was, you don't need a pulmonary valve. They'll be fine. Well, they were fine for many years until they continued to live and then they became not so fine. Um, and so many of these patients do have uh, dilated RVs, and honestly, just even in our patients that have valve sparing um, surgeries continue to have some RV dysfunction. So what do we recommend in our patients with a subpulmonary uh, RV failure? Um, in asymptomatics, unless they have the pulmonary valve regurgitation that we talked about in Tetralogy Fallot, there's really no medical therapy that we recommend. So if you have a low EF on your right side and you're asymptomatic, as much as we want to do something, we don't have data to really support doing that. If you're symptomatic um, and if you have uh, pulmonary uh, arterial hypertension, then obviously we need to treat their PAH. Um, and the, the PD-5 inhibitors and the ERAs have the most data in congenital heart disease, but we're starting to get more with the prostacyclin analogs. And obviously if they're symptomatic, then you can use diuretics as well of patients who are born with a systemic RV. And so these are really going to be talking about now, most commonly you're kind of talking about your detransposition patients um, that had a, the uh, atrial switch years ago, so your mustards or your sinnings. And so now all of a sudden we moved your arteries and so your RV is pumping to your body. The other case that this is is in uh, L transposition or con congenitally corrected transposition to where patients were just born where their ventricle switched 
And so their um, RV is, has, is and has always been pumping blood to their body. In asymptomatic patients, even if their RVEF is low, I would say we really don't have a role for medical therapy in that we don't have enough data to show that if someone doesn't have heart failure, that they would benefit from medications. In symptomatic patients, I think we can use the standard LV heart failure therapies, but again, we, we need to disclose to our patients that we're not sure that this is gonna help um, and really watch for side effects. I think that there are promising um, uh, data with Subiquitil and uh, Valsartan, so maybe we should prioritize Entresto, and uh, again, looking at, at CRT. If we're going to extrapolate our conventional therapy, I would say we need to keep in mind that we need to watch for side effects. So beta blockers in particular, we need to watch for development of conduction abnormalities, especially in your uh, transposition patients because they're going to be prone for that. So we need to make sure we're not making them worse by trying to make them better. And in the same of our vasodilatator therapies, especially in our detransposition that have the baffles, some of their baffles can be more rigid and have obstruction. And if we vasodilate them, on the, we may be compromising some of their cardiac output. Now we're going to switch over to the last group, our single ventricle, our Fontan patients. Again, the group that actually is probably increasing most in um, percentage of adulthood just because of the great surgical improvements that's been in the hypoplastic left heart syndrome. So kind of in our Fontan patients, again, if you're asymptomatic and you have normal pressures, you could argue that you really, there's no data for using medical therapy in these patients. If you have patients that do have elevated pulmonary pressures or maybe have some symptoms of exercise incapacity and they don't have an elevated ventricular diastolic pressure or substantially elevated, then using um, the, PDF, the, vas the pulmonary vasodilator therapies is very reasonable, and many times it's very well tolerated. In symptomatic patients, um, we can employ standard heart failure patients, but this is a group that I would say that I would, this really needs to be co-management with an adult congenital specialist because we need to look at some of the cautions and uh, the risk of making some of these patients worse.